Welcome to Dates and Dead Guys. The American frontier in the mid to late 1800s was a dangerous place for new settlers. The Southwest was home to Native Americans like the Apache. They were a raiding people. A brutal reputation and expertise in stealth made them terrifying. And they would live up to their reputation. If settlers were lucky, they got away with their property or cattle before they even knew that they were there. But many were not lucky. Raiding societies inevitably have high mortality rates. In order to sustain your population, kidnapping your rival's children becomes a viable option. Today, we will explore the stories of two of the most significant kidnappings ever committed by the Apache. The first is the story of Mickey Free, whose abduction caused a war between the Americans and the Chiricahua. The second is the story of Charlie McComas, a young boy whose kidnapping remains one of the great mysteries of the late 1800s. But before we get started, I research historical topics I find interesting and explain them in a way I would to my friends. If that is your kind of thing, please subscribe and leave a like on the video. If you really like it, share it. It supports me and it will help grow the channel. But let's get to our stories. Mickey Free was one of the most famous of the Apache scouts. Look through the images. He comes up constantly because between 1872 and 1886, he was present on the majority of major military campaigns at the time. But despite living with the Apache and working with them as a scout, Mickey Free wasn't born one. As a child, his name was Felix Ward, and he lived on a ranch in the Sonosha Valley in southern Arizona. That is where he was captured. Many settlers were taken by raids, but this one was different. His kidnapping was going to trigger the longest war in American history. Even more crazy is that Mickey Free will help end the war 25 years later after the Apache found him hiding in that peach tree. Quote, We can reasonably surmise young Felix's state of mind as his captors carried him away from the Sonosha Valley in 1861. Here was a skinny, five and one half foot tall, 13 year old boy. His childhood made wretched by the constantly marauding Apaches. Now he found himself in the hands of Los Barbaros, the boogeyman of his youth. He must have expected horrible torture and lingering death." End quote. When Felix was 13, he was playing outside in a peach tree. His stepfather, John Ward, was away on business. This is not the first raid the ranch had experienced. Three times over the past few years they had been hit and their cattle had been stolen. Years later, when asked about his abduction, he said all he could remember was the long ride. The Apache took him, rode east, and disappeared without a trace. Raids were part of Apache culture. They took the resources they needed. They also captured settlers and other Native Americans regularly. And whether they would keep them alive though, that was a legitimate question. Women and young children had a good chance of being adopted into the tribe or being held as slaves or for ransom. Men and teenage boys were almost always killed and the Apache could get creative. Felix was 13. In most cases, he should have been killed, but he wasn't, so why not? He was small for his age and very skinny, making him look younger than he was. That definitely helped. But it was probably because he was blind in one eye, left that way from an infection that he had when he was a baby. The chief of the group that took him took pity on him because he happened to also be blind in one eye. Although that didn't stop him from selling him a few weeks later. John Ward returned home the day after the raid had captured Felix. Immediately, he goes to the military at nearby Fort Buchanan, and they send out Lieutenant George Bascom and 54 men to go get the boy back. Bascom finds a trail heading east to where the Chiricahua Apache live and the Apache Pass, which is actually my background for this episode. Generally, no other group would go that way, so Bascom incorrectly surmised the Chiricahua were the group of Apache that took Felix. What he didn't account for was that new forts being built might cause groups to change their routes and travel to avoid the U.S. military. Using Indian scouts, because you have to to even find the Apache, Bascom made contact with the Chiricahua, and they meet with Chief Cochise in a military tent, and some of his family members came along with him. Cochise was willing to do this because at this time there was relative peace between the Chiricahua and the U.S. Bascom, however, works to change that. He recklessly accused the Chiricahua of taking the boy and demanded that he be returned. He told Cochise that he was their captive until Felix would be brought back. Cochise tried to reason with Bascom, even going as far as to offer his services and helping them find him. But Bascom wasn't having it. 
Realizing this was a dead end, Cochise springs up, takes a blade out that he had concealed, and in a split second slices through the canvas of the tent and escapes into the mountains. His brother and nephews didn't escape, and the military was able to hold them hostage. All further attempts at negotiation fail, so Cochise goes hunting. He finds some Americans to take hostage and offers Bascom in exchange, his hostages for his family back. But Bascom holds his ground and says that he would only take Felix in exchange, who Cochise did not and never had. So what was Cochise to do? Well, he got creative with his captives and Bascom found the mess after he had fled back into Mexico. Bascom, in retaliation, hangs Cochise's family members. This event, the Bascom Affair, starts the 25-year-long Apache Wars, all over a boy, Felix Ward. So let's get back to him. Felix Ward wasn't taken by the Chiricahua, and different sources say different things, but he was either taken by the Pinal Apache or the Arabapa. But he will later be traded to the Coyotero or White Mountain Apache. With the Coyotero, Felix was adopted. We don't have a lot of information of what his childhood was like. His adopted brother, however, famous in his own right, John Rope, a Medal of Honor recipient, said, quote, He was raised with me, but we always treated him like he was one of us. End quote. We know that as an Apache, he went on raids against both Native Americans and white settlers. But it seems that he had very few run-ins with the U.S. military. That is until 1872, when George Crook would force his group to Fort Apache, and he would wind up on reservation. When the Apache were forced to reservations, usually their captives would be reunited with their families. But that didn't happen for Felix. His brother Santiago would find him, but told him that while he was gone, both his mother and his adopted father had died. Santiago tried to get Felix to come home with him, but he decided to stay with the Apache on reservation and become a scout. In November 1872, General George Crook starts trying to enlist Apache to work as scouts for the U.S. Army. It sounds strange, but this appealed to many Apache men. Life on reservation was not suited to warrior culture, but being a scout who seeks out and fights the enemy was. So even though they were pressured to the reservation by the military, it gave them their best option. The military was rather choosy in picking scouts. And in a practice we would find rather offensive today, the soldiers would rename who got in because they had a hard time pronouncing Apache names. When Felix was selected as a scout, he still went by his original name. It seems the Apache never renamed him, which is strange. But it didn't stop the soldiers from doing it. Felix was 5'7 and about 135 pounds. He had fairer skin than the Apache and reddish brown hair. It is commonly said that he was half Irish and half Mexican, but that may or may not be true. Additionally, his one blind eye gave him a menacing appearance. It reminded the soldiers of a character from a popular book, Charles O'Malley, The Irish Dragon. The character was a manservant named Mickey Free. And from that point on, and for the rest of his life, he went by that name. And Mickey Free would turn out to be a hell of a scout and an interpreter. Throughout the 1870s and 1880s, Mickey Free was constantly used by General George Crook, Emmett Crawford, and Al Sieber. The military could never find Apache without the scouts, making them very useful. Having never learned to read and write, we have no documents written by him directly, but those around us give us a sense of his reputation, and he stood out. A soldier Mickey worked with, Tom Horn, infamous in his own right, he probably killed a kid, said, quote, he, Mickey, now spoke both Mexican and Apache like a professor, end quote. Maybe not like a professor. Others said he had a hard time with Spanish verb conjugation, so it was hard to tell if he was talking about something in the past, present, or future. Horn recalled, quote, and was the wildest daredevil in the world at his time, end quote. There are stories, like the ones from John Burke's journals, about how Mickey would throw himself in harm's way by literally running out to the Apache that they were just in a gunfight with to start negotiating. In Horn's eyes, Mickey, quote, was thoroughly qualified for a typical scout and guide in every sense, except for the fact that he had never any regard for his own life, end quote. He was also disliked by many Apache, especially on reservation with the Chiricahua, who he helped force there as a scout. He wasn't nice about his work, and was once called perhaps the worst man on reservation. 
But his last big adventure would come in 1885, when Geronimo and the Chiricahua break out of San Carlos Reservation one last time. Strangely enough, Geronimo blamed Mickey Free for the Chiricahua leaving. When the Americans were given reasons that the Chiricahua fled the San Carlos Reservation in 1885, they blamed Mickey Free. Mickey had arrested some of them for drinking, which was illegal, and for beating their wives, which the Apache argued wasn't. One Apache chief, Nana, is quoted by the reservation authorities to have said of the situation and Mickey, quote, he can't advise me on how to treat my women, end quote. It's really strange, but Nana may technically be correct, at least from his point of view. The Apache were promised when they came to the reservation that they would not be prosecuted for such offenses. But domestic violence was an ongoing issue on reservation, and it tended to tie directly into drinking their favorite beverage, Tiswin. Regardless, in May, about 150 Apache, led by Geronimo, had broken out of San Carlos and fled into Mexico. What followed was a massive effort to catch them. Mickey Free initially worked as a scout and interpreter in their efforts. They were able to catch up and locate the band several times, even getting very close to a few surrenders. But the death of Captain Emmett Crawford in the pursuit and an alcohol and rumor-fueled failure to close the deal in 1885 led to General Crook being replaced by Nelson Miles. He used scouts far less aggressively than Crook and left Mickey free in a bit of a limbo. That is, until he sent him to Washington to try to handle negotiations with the Apache from there. In July of 1886, Mickey free and a small delegation of Apache were sent to Washington. Washington wanted interpreters there so that when Geronimo was caught, they would be able to understand and send messages via telegraph. Among them was a scout named Chato, who I only bring up because he will be present in our next story, from before he was a scout. The trip is hampered by poor communication due to broken telegraph lines, but by September, Geronimo's band had surrendered for the final time. The remaining Chiricahua were believed to be too dangerous to send to a local prison or to be allowed to return to San Carlos, so they were sent to a more serious prison in Florida. Other Apache they felt were dangerous, like Cheda, even though he was now a scout, were sent there as well. Mickey Free was sent one last time as an interpreter, and for about a month he stayed at Fort Marion in Florida, translating the end of a war that started with his capture as Felix Ward 25 years earlier. Mickey Free lived a long life after the end of the Apache Wars in 1886, but there is a lot we don't know. He never learned to read and write, so we don't have his thoughts about anything or his account of events. He's a bit of a mystery, but if you like mysteries, you're really going to like this next story. In 1924, a group of Bronco Apache conducted a raid in New Mexico, the last known Apache raid on American soil. Apache went through the countryside, killing a rancher and stealing supplies and cattle. Before they slipped back into Mexico, a white bearded man on horseback was witnessed. Who was this white Apache warrior? A kidnapped child raised Apache? Well, some said it was Charlie McComas. Charlie was a six-year-old boy, in 1883, he lived with his mother and father in Silver City, New Mexico. That year, in late March, his family was having a picnic near Thompson Canyon, a choke point that forces travelers on a specific route. Unbeknownst to them, a sub-chief named Chato led an Apache raiding party of nearly 30 men. They knew of the choke point and were waiting for the unsuspecting travelers. Hours later, the results of the raid were discovered. It appeared from the evidence that the raiders were basically on top of the McComas family before they even knew they were there. Charlie's father, Hamilton McComas, appears to have handed over the reins of their horse-drawn buckboard to his wife, Juniana. He then grabbed his rifle, jumped out of the buckboard, and tried to make a stand while she and young Charlie made a run for freedom. His body was found with seven bullet holes. Despite the heroic efforts of her husband, Juniana didn't make it far. She was overtaken by the raiders. She grabbed Charlie and tried to get away on foot, but was caught and bludgeoned to death, probably with the butt of a rifle. What was missing from the scene was Charlie. It was clear to those searching that the Apache had taken him. Before the locals or military were able to rally and take on the band of raiders, they had slipped back into Mexico. This was a common tactic used by the Apache. The US military was not permitted to cross the border, so border hopping was very useful in conducting raids. It plagued American efforts for years. 
However, just two months later, in May, a new international treaty gave the U.S. military permission to pursue hostile Indians into Mexico. General George Crook took action immediately. The purpose of the mission was not solely to go find Charlie, but it was one of their objectives. These missions always included Indian scouts. There was never any finding Apache without them. And in just a few weeks, the scouts and military forces found Chato's Rancheria. And wouldn't you know it, one of the leaders of the scouts was Mickey Free. A fight breaks out. Many Apache escape, but nine are killed and five captured. Of those killed, they are not just warriors. Some are women, young and elderly. When the captured were questioned about Charlie, one of the women said he was taken away when the scouts were first detected. But when many of the nearby Apache began to surrender to the army, Charlie never showed up. And the Apache there said in the chaos he had gotten away and ran off. John G. Burke, an officer with the army, wrote about it in his account called An Apache Campaign in the Sierra Madre. He wrote, quote, Charlie McComas was never found. The Chiricahuas insist, and I think truthfully, that he was in the rancheria destroyed by Crawford, that he escaped, terror-stricken, to the depths of the mountains, that the country was so rough, the timber and brushwood so thick, that his tracks could not be followed. Even had there not been such a violent fall of rain during the succeeding nights, all accounts agree in this." End quote. So according to the Chiricahua, Charlie got away in the mountains and in the dense vegetation and with the rain, he was just gone. Well, that's what they said. But that's not what happened. We can say very confidently that what the Chiricahua told the army in the May of 1883 was a lie. But there are two likely possibilities to what actually happened. One explanation comes from Jason Betzinas, an Apache warrior who fought against the U.S. in the 1880s. He wrote a book called I Fought with Geronimo that was published in 1959. He wrote that after Charlie's capture, he began to quickly learn the Apache language and that he was treated kindly. Between March and May, an Apache family had taken him in and effectively adopted him. They expected him to become a full member of the tribe in time. But in May, when the Apache scouts had attacked the rancheria, many Apache fled taking Charlie with them. In the fighting, the scouts had killed an elderly woman, the mother of an Apache warrior named Speedy who had already escaped. When Speedy discovered the death of his mother, he went into a rage and bludgeoned Charlie to death with a rock. Now, Bedzina says very clearly he wasn't there for this, but a woman named Ramona, who he knew, was an eyewitness who had told him. The only reason that it took 80 years to come out was because Bedzina wasn't willing to tell the story until everyone involved had passed. But was the story true? Maybe. But the army searched for Charlie for quite some time, and they never found a body. There is one more explanation. In the decades that followed, the Apache were the last holdouts to life on reservation. Although the vast majority had already resigned there by the mid-1880s, isolated groups of them, called Bronco Apache, existed in the Sierra Madre. For years, there were strange sightings and stories of a bearded white man among them. They come from many sources, as recent as 1924 in a raid in New Mexico, or one even later in 1930 when a Mexican village was attacked by these Broncos. Then, in 1940, a woman who had been captured was interrogated. She claimed that the white bearded Apache people had seen had been killed just a few years before, that he was stabbed to death in a fight over a girl. She said his body was thrown into a pit. She even led a team of archaeologists to it. The remains were taken for examination, and it turned out to be a white man who had blue eyes and red hair, just like Charlie. So was this Charlie McComas? Unfortunately, we'll probably never know. Thanks for watching. I'm sorry these videos take so long to come out. Uh, they take a lot of research, and I am just not a fast reader. If you want to see more stories like this one, be sure to check out the other videos on the channel. I have been on a bit of an Apache kick recently, so a lot of my recent ones are on topics just like this. The recent growth of the channel has just been awesome. So if you like the content, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, or share. It really helps. I have a few more topics I would like to cover with the Apache before I move on, so if you have any suggestions, please leave that in the comments, and maybe I'll add it to the list.